I come from a family of writers in the West, all of us enjoying the freedom to say pretty much what we please. In Turkey, meanwhile, writing can land one in jail for all sorts of reasons, as this program will show. In 2002, International Pen cited over 100 cases of persecuted Turkish writers, and I journeyed there to acquire a deeper understanding of how such writers persevere. Meet 32-year-old Asiya Zebek. Her prison memoir, A Rape Under Torture, has been published in six countries, arousing international concern. Just prior to my visit to Turkey, she had brought charges to the European Court of Human Rights against eight officers who she says tortured and repeatedly raped her for 12 days in 1997 while she was in detention at a police station on her way to jail. Her crime? Editing a socialist newspaper. İnsanlar yüzleşmekten bahsediyor. Kendimle yüzleşmek. Beş aydır köşe bucak kaçtığım şey bu. İşte bu yüzleşmek. Kaldıramam. Yüzleşmek çektiğim acının bin kat, milyon kat artması demek. O kadar güçsüzüm ki taşıyamam. Oysa ben yaşamak istiyorum. Sadece nefes alıp vermek de olsa bunun adı yaşamak istiyorum. Yüzleşirsen ölürüm. Tecavüz ettiler diyorum bin bir zorlukla. Bunu bana o an neyin söylettiğini bilmiyorum. Ağlıyorum. Yer yarılsa da kaybolsam içinde. Yüzüme bak, gözlerime bak diyor Arif. Bizim bütün kinimiz bunu yapanlara. Niye utanıyorsun? Utanması gereken o alçaklar kaldır başını diyor. Söyledim, anlattım. Ama bir şartla yaptım bunu. Hiç kimseye anlatmayacağına dair söz verdi. Kimsenin bilmesini istemiyorum. Bunun duyulmasını istemiyorum. Bunu gizlemenin yanlış olduğunu, açıklamam ve hesap sormak gerektiğini ama eğer istemiyorsam kimseye anlatmayacağını söyledi. Arif'ten bu sözü aldıktan sonra anlattım. Kitabı yazarken düşünmedim. Kitap çıktıktan sonra gelen tepkilerden, gelen mektuplardan böyle bir şeye yol açtığını when uh, she was in prison and met other women there, did she discover that others had been effectively tortured? I mean, this is a, a torture of rape. Uh, had other women suffered the same thing? And did she come to realize that it was in any way systemic? Cezaevine girmeden önce de, yani Türkiye'de işkencenin özellikle siyasi tutuklulara yönelik sistemli bir şekilde uygulandığını az çok biliyordum. Ama cezaevinde e, benim kaldığım koğuşta 30 kişi vardı. E, tüm cezaevinde yaklaşık 300-400 civarında insan vardı ve işkenceden geçmemiş tek bir insan yoktu. Kadınlar arasında e, tecavüze uğramış insanlar vardı. E, ben ilk duruşmaya çıktım, açıkladım. Benden sonra bir arkadaş daha e, açıklamıştı. Dönemler yani e, öldürmeyi falan düşünüyordum aslında. <gülüyor> yani bir, ama şimdi öyle düşünmüyorum. Yani onlara verilebilecek en ağır ceza herhalde bu suçların bütün dünya önünde, bütün kamuoyu önünde teşhir edilmesi, açıklanması olurdu. Onların amacı beni yok etmekti. 
Hı. Beni öldürmekti. Yani ruhsal olarak, kişilik olarak. Yani bunu başaramadıklarını söylemek isterdim. İşte düşman var tekrar. Yani büyük bir ihtimalle sonuçlanacak. Ben beraat bekliyorum ama avukatlarım pek umutlu değil bu konuda. <gülüyor> beraat olmasını bekliyorum. I'm sorry to be naive here, but I thought she's already been in prison for five years. She was arrested, but she wasn't convicted. So her case is still going on. You know. Where I come from, you, a citizen has a guarantee to a speedy trial. Well, in Turkey, most political trials are extremely slow. She has been in jail for five and a half years, and my personal view is that if there wasn't international sport, she would have been still in. And I think three years, five years, seven years, up to ten years of people being in prison without being convicted is a norm. Yeah. The norm. For the political cases. Will there be observers? Will people be in the court watching how it goes? Uh, izleyiciler olacak mı? Göz, göz, göz yes. Mm -hmm. And can that make any difference? Well, you know. Swedish so pen then. Swedish pen will be here. Swedish pen. <laughs> As a journalist, you're trained to be objective, even dispassionate, so you don't just swallow any old guff that's given you. But there are moments when moral outrage rises in your throat. You're distracted at first by what seem to be legitimate claims that there are national security issues at stake here, or even the suggestion that the writers persecuted are the marginal ones, the dissident ones, the ones who are uh, inciting people to violence. Then you get into the personal details of the matter. Asiya Zebek spent five years in prison without having had a trial. October 16th, she will finally have a trial, at which point, and the lawyer is pessimistic, she may spend another four years. For what? For having written for a communist newspaper. If you want to subscribe to a democracy, it seems to me you have to subscribe to its fundamentals. Right to association, right to assembly, right to freedom of speech, and a right to a speedy trial. By any standards, regardless of what you think of her work or her political attitude, this is an outrage. Contemporary Turkey should always be viewed with the past in uh, retrospective. The Ottoman Empire spent its uh, last 100 years uh, trying to uh, resist disintegration from all, all sorts of corners. Um, the, uh, the Ottoman uh, elite, the psyche of the elite, was full uh, of anxiety and that, that you know everything was disintegrating. The, the Balkan lands were lost in the Balkan Wars, North Africa was lost. Uh, there, were fight, there were fighting wars on all fronts in the Caucasus, in the Middle East. Um, so there was sort of serious sort of trauma in the elite, in, in, in, in the people who were running the country, that everything was disintegrating and ev that, you know, the question of existence was there. So this certainly has reflected in the values that the republic that was established on, you know, on the ashes of the empire. Yeah. And then, you know, it's important to see where um, where this, this line of thinking is coming from. Modern Turkey was founded by Kemal Atatürk in 1923. It is a democracy, but at the sufferance of its military. Turkey is highly sensitive to its ethnic minorities, Kurds in particular, as threats to national security, and has stopped at almost nothing to protect it. 
After a vicious civil war that left over 30,000 dead in the Kurdish southeast, it has been illegal to broadcast or teach in Kurdish, to write sympathetically about Kurdish autonomy, or even raise a toast to it at a wedding. Despite some amendments, many writers who broke the law then are still facing charges now, a situation that Turkey's establishment media is not challenging with much urgency. Here, for example, is Altamur Kilic, a former politician and a well-known columnist at Turkiye, Turkey's influential far-right newspaper. This is my study, but rather because we are in the process of moving back from the States. I see. And I had 3,000 volumes, yes. but I gave them to my school and to the military schools. I see. And a picture of Mr. Atatürk? Yes. Yeah. Were you a friend of him too? My father was his very close friend, and that's in front of our house. I see. And signed to me. I see. One of the criteria that really concerns me is uh, freedom of expression because the documentary we're making is about writers and, um, and with some concern for writers who have been uh, imprisoned for what they've written or published. <laughs> well, listen, we went through a uh, Cold War and there was an active subversive communist movement. If we had not taken action, Turkey would have become a Russian satellite. I mean, of course, we are many ethnic groups, and they should have rights and so on. But to go against the unitary nation state of Turkey is wrong. We have spoken to at least one person. Um, I'm thinking of one, a woman named Asiya Zebek. You may have heard of her. Uh, she used to be the editor in chief of Atilim, uh, another, you know, uh, socialist Marxist newspaper. She spent uh, almost five years in jail without having had a trial. Yeah. Uh, I think she has a trial pending in October. Yeah. And uh, she stands to spend another four years, you know, and this is because she has been identified as a, a terrorist. That what happens is these, Maybe these she was. crimes of right. Well, she was a writer. You, <laughs> Maybe she was. you don't make terror only by weapons. You make terror with uh, words, too. But or if, you incite terror by uh, words. Well, I, I think the point is that I, that I agree with you that once upon a time there was a Soviet threat, yes. particularly there considering the geographic just next proximity. Door to Soviet Russia. Exactly. But it's no longer so. And do you think it's time maybe to, it is to, lift, to lift the penalties on Daniel, some of these it people? It is coming. If they don't belabor the point, it will be. It is here. I'm not saying that the trial system, the justice system is uh, perfect. Uh, the uh, trial, the court trials take a long time and the decisions are, the judges the same. There are many faults, of course. But we have to view everything in the context of what we have gone through and what dangers we have confronted. We, are, uh, we don't have the luxury of being Canada. We don't have the luxury of being Slovakia. <laughs> we, uh, and we are not an African uh, state. We have a tradition. We have our own uh, sensitivity, that I always say. And we have to, you have to view all this through this perspective. And I'm sure you're doing it. Indeed we are. Esper Yamodorelli, blind since boyhood, has been in and out of jail for over 20 years for his writings on Kurdish issues. It was in the notorious Sinop Castle that he remembers his jailers informing him, with sadistic nonchalance, of a scorpion on the wall of his cell. This experience inspired him to write a play about state terrorism, The Scorpion. In it, The Scorpion is not only a physical threat, but also a symbol of psychological terror and a metaphor for an unseen poisonous regime. It was published in 10 languages and had a three-year successful run in, of all places, Ankara, Turkey's capital. Perhaps you'd like to take my arm? Yeah. Okay. 
In 1978, there had been accusations, uh, accusations of hiding stolen goods, uh, leading an armed robbery, um, not to mention the membership in the illegal organization. Were these other things true? Were you leading an armed robbery? No. How can I do that? It's like we're having a dissident's tea party. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, there go my papers. Oh, there goes the scorpion across the grass. When I was lived in prisons, when I was living with them, and I was one of them, I heard hundreds of stories, and I read many files. And as a lawyer, a man who knows what law is, I really astonished what is happening. When my writings were published in English, firstly in England, after that, uh, many fan clubs adopted me as an honorary member. Honorary member. So Canada was among them. Were you encouraged? Were they helpful? Yeah, of course. How? When you are, when you live in prison, every bit of little thing is more important for you. Especially this kind of sports. I got ten thousands of letters all over the world, and there were many fantastics in them, especially. Uh, some little children were writing. You know what surprises me? It's that prison officials would even show you these postcards. It would be so easy for them to, you know, tear them up, throw them out, and deny you the comfort and the support. Oh, they did for many times. And I got my letters only, I think, only a quarter of them. <laughs> From what I understand, the harassment continues. Uh, at present, the government is, uh, is it the government, the, the courts, are trying to prevent you from uh, practicing your legal profession. Is that right? Many times, Justice Ministry wrote to them that they have to be dismissed from the Bar Association because I am a terrorist and I was sentenced. So I can't do my law profession. But Istanbul Bar Association denied and resist to their uh, to their decision, and I am going on with my law profession. Okay. When I was a fugitive, uh, one of the men who has a high position in the state offered me that if I go to Europe illegally, it will be better for me and for the state. He offered me. Oh, if, if I live here, he said, you will to put in the prison. It is better for us, for the state and you, to leave the country. And I rejected and I went to the jail. And now we are staying here, that the weather is lovely, <laughs> the scene is lovely. <laughs> Turkey is really, actually, a lovely country. Turkey is truly fraught with contradictions. Under the penal system, it is illegal to make fun of the military. Yet, Le Mans, the satirical weekly, commands Turkey's highest circulation and, despite frequent prosecution and heavy fines, is still permitted to publish. Have you ever uh, got into trouble for this? Yes. Many, many times. Many times. And but you know, what are you uh, related to somebody rich and famous? How come you're not in jail? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> 
Açılı, açılıyor ve açılmaya devam ediyor bu dergi e, sürdüğü sürece. E, benim de bazı davalarım, mahkum olduğum bazı davalarım işte bir kısmı beraatle sonuçlanırken e, bir iki tanesinden mahkum oldum. İşte onlar ertelendi ya da işte para cezasına çevrildi. Bir tanesinden de e, çok uzun bir süre kaçak yaşamak. <gülüyor> Turkey is strewn with journalists who have lost their jobs for having written contentious articles or columns. But on a more insidious level, the environment has simply proved too hostile for others to write in. Take Asla Erdogan, an accomplished fiction writer with numerous European awards. Motions to avoid the blood of the city spilling. So I was, I was, I tried to say the blood of the city staining them, staining. A dark, perverse gaze always at your back. As if you look into a well and suddenly realize it's the well looking back at you. For two years, Erdogan wrote a popular column called The Others for Radikal, Turkey's mainstream center-left daily. There she fused literary prose with social commentary, focusing on, among other things, women's rights, prisoner stories, and the Kurds. I tackled special cases like, uh, I don't know, there's a woman I wrote about, for example, she was in prison for five years, she had cancer, and the law insisted that she had to be let out because of fatal disease, and she wasn't. She wasn't given any treatment, a Kurdish woman. So I wrote her case, for example, that was a, just her story, and she was let out finally. Two other colonists wrote, this is a moment I felt a victory. Then later, a year later, she died, and I felt very ashamed of this feeling of victory. Yes, it was a victory. We helped her to get out. Yes, she was happy to die at home, but still, I mean, it's it's the moment that I learned writing cannot save anyone from death. First, as a columnist, I didn't have to give the news, but I very deliberately made it very open that I'm not objective, that I'm on the side of the oppressed. I, I try to be on the side of the oppressed. And in a way, I found it as a kind of, um, you know, writing is a kind of power. But there are things that I feel guilty of not writing about. Uh, a few cases I should have been more careful than this and that, but now I'm, my conscience is very clean. There is no way for me to prove it in a court or in a regular, I mean, a legal environment. But I'm very sure I was followed and harassed. I had fear. I, I got very, very scared. There were times uh, I think I was going totally paranoid even. And I, I couldn't write literature, for example, for the last two years. And I think one of the reasons was that, you, you know, when there's a knife in your throat, or you feel that way, you can't sing. Erdogan has abandoned journalism for fiction and wrestles not to lose that voice altogether. Meanwhile, like Erdogan, Ahmet Altan is known for both his fiction and his newspaper columns, but no Turkish daily will publish his journalism, not after he wrote a column in Milyet, one of the majors, asking how the Turkish people would react if they were living in a country called Kurde, where the Turkish language was prohibited and the houses of Turkish peasants were burned. This piece of political fiction was regarded as seditious, and Altan was sentenced to a suspended term of a year and a half in jail. How come so many uh, people in your family became writers? Because you're, well, bro you're brothers as well. Yes, right? as well, yeah. I don't know. Huh. It's funny. To pursue a writing career in Turkey mm -hmm. um, can invite trouble. So, <laughs> you, so you're consistent? <laughs> yes. Uh, Obviously. It's, it's, it's part of our life you know, in Turkey. If you write, it means you can have trouble. If you write, you know that you can have trouble. Mm -hmm. It's part of your profession. Mm -hmm. So yes, I had some troubles, and but it's not a big deal. Hmm. It's not your field, or it's not, it's not my field, or Oran's field, or you know. Yeah. It's my new book. It will be published in three weeks. 
you say that it's it's boring for uh, writers with a, a literary mind mm -hmm. here to receive foreigners like us <laughs> uh, who only want to talk politics. Would you like to develop this idea? <laughs> uh, first of all, it's boring. You know, I'm not a politician. I'm a writer. I like to talk about literature. And uh, you can easily understand that. They do not care about your literature or Turkish literature or your books or something like that. They are trying to find out some victims or martyrs. Mm -hmm. I don't like to be seen as a martyr or victim or something like that. I'm not. I'm a writer. If you look at the history of great literature, Victor Hugo, uh, Jean Genet, I mean, there's so many who, who, whose writing has been a political cry. Who, uh, who, who, through literature, through the examination of the human spirit, are revealing things about sure. the political realities of their we country. We do our part in our country. We do that. But I write about politics. I write about Kurds. I write about torture. But I didn't write them because I like to write them. I write them because I feel I must write them. Hmm. But I'm not happy hmm. to write about them. I want to write something else. I want to write my novels about literature. Hmm. So we do what we have to do in our country. I think there are two kinds of attitude in Turkey about feelings. One of them is to hide your feelings. It's very Middle Eastern. The second one, to express your feeling by exaggerating, especially in art. So I want to just, as I said, so tempt them to express it, say so. If you love, say, I love you. If you want to fight, just fight. If you see something unfair, go for struggle. So it's the reason. And uh, did you write an unorthodox kind of, of journalism? In other words, did the journalistic language, was it infused with this emotional quality? Yes. If you cannot touch life, in journalism or in literature, you are funny. You are nothing. They will not read you. They will look at you. You will have watchers, not readers.